Well, th thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. You've all seen the jacket, so I'm going to take it off now. I also want to clarify something. The, the first name is Raymond, like there was a Y in it. Yes, my parents were very mean to me and, and were ahead of their time. Now we spell names incorrectly for style, you know, like Katie, K-A-Y-T-E-E, -E, you know, things like that. And uh, my parents spelled Raymond like Ramon. It was not an issue when I was younger because we had a small Hispanic population. That tells you how old I am. Uh, but now everybody thinks I'm Hispanic and, and I'm here because of affirmative action. It's, it's quite annoying in some cases. I always thought so. It's, <laughs> the annoying is, is something else entirely. It's a carefully cultivated trait. Um, I'll be telling you about my paper with Tianning Li. It's called Business Formation in the Wake of States' Responses to Kilo. You notice there's a line through the original title, which was How Did Kilo Affect Business Formation? That was the original title. That was the question we set out to answer. Uh, this is probably going to be the closest academic present or closest thing to a pure academic presentation you're going to see here. Uh, but this presentation is more about how we flailed our way into this current title and how you can make mistakes and how you shouldn't let them get you down and how you should uh, proceed in cases like that and, and some lessons you might learn. Uh, in fact, I'm only going to put up one table. Here are the takeaways. These are my goals today. You are very rarely going to know your result until you're well along with your talk. Uh, we thought we knew our results. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we wrote several drafts, presented at a conference or two, um, and we were completely wrong. Nobody noticed. Uh, you, I will share three research lessons uh, for your hour of need, and I'd like to make the point that when you're studying what appear to be dated cases, if you do them right and extract the economics, the economics is not going to change, and they can inform current decisions. I have an example that's very recent. Um, for those of you that are interested in the results of the paper itself, what did happen to business formation? Uh, probably nothing. Uh, now, our model sets a very low bar for proper behavior by the state, but the state does seem to get over that. Uh, the moral to the story, though, is to stay vigilant, because this is what people have missed in the literature and what we have missed. It's not the results of Kilo that matter. In uh, June of 2005, the Supreme Court ruled in Kilo that the public use clause uh, lets government take private property for transfer to private owners. Um, this is new not because of the takings. Those are actually uh, have a very, very long history. Uh, what's new here is the transfer to private owners. Instead of taking your house or your business to build a bridge or a road, we're going to take your house or your business and we're going to give it to you, a developer, and let you make some condos out of it. Okay, that's what's new. Um, the Kilo backlash probably resulted in more new state legislation than any other Supreme Court decision in history. This is the most politically charged debate you could possibly see, maybe accepting the most recent Obamacare decision. Uh, listen to some of these quotes. While most constitutional decisions affect a small number of people, this decision undermines the rights of every American except the most politically connected. Every home, small business, or church would produce more taxes as a shopping center or office building. And according to the court, that's a good enough reason for eminent domain. On the other hand, we have people saying things like, if we don't use this power, cities will die. This is rampant hyperbole. It's obvious that those are extreme corner solutions, and somewhere in between we'll find reality. Uh, but people react viscerally to this. Um, notice, both of those are about social outcomes, whether it's good for liberty or whether it's good for the economy. The Supreme Court is supposed to rule about law. The Supreme Court should not consider either of these positions. They should consider none of them. Their job is to say, what does the Constitution say? It's not their role to decide whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, we set out to find out what the data tell us. 
oops, I'm sorry, I'm running late. Those are the two quotes. And, and here's where I am now. Um, research adage number one. Um, estimate the time it'll take to complete a research project, then triple it, and then prepare to be disappointed. It's just the way things go. Um, the, actually, the research lesson is, is this. Um, that's optimistic. I, I, I don't think that's true anymore. That's optimistic. When I began this project, it was going to be a quick and easy paper. It would be fun. It would let me answer a question that I had, which was how did Kilo affect business formation? And, and that was the paper's original title, how did Kilo affect business formation? Uh, it hasn't been quick. It hasn't been easy. It has been quite fun. Um, but it turns out that we can't even answer the question we set out to do. Uh, actually, it's more accurate to say we've been distracted from that question. We found a more interesting one. Uh, but take heart here. Um, it happens in other sciences as well. If you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. And that's a big mistake. So at least I'm working on hard problems. When, they, when you hit these things, don't let it bother you. Press on. It's, it's a lot more interesting than, than this one, which is also applicable. No scientist is admired for failing to solve a problem beyond his competence. Um, we're, we're kind of in that position here. We weren't able to solve the problem. But at least we know why we can't solve the problem. Research lesson two is that if you're sure that you know the answer to the question, then you don't need a model. If you're 100% sure you've got it right, then you don't need to model it. You don't need to think it through the economics. Whether you model it in mathematical form or whether you model it in words in your head, you don't need to think it all the way through if you're sure you got the answer right. The problem is, is that you might not know the answer. You might think you know the answer. The corollary is, if you aren't sure, then you need to formulate a model. Now, I'm using the term model more loosely than most people. Most people sit and say, well, you need to write down uh, a mathematical model, and this is the way you're going to try to get the world uh, uh, formulated so that you can make predictions about it and, and understand what's going on. You can also model it in your head. It might be less rigorous, it might not be mathematical, but there are fundamental principles and a level of rigor that you can apply rather than just giving half thought out statements. If you're sure you're right, then you, then you don't need the model. But if you aren't sure, uh, then, then you need to write one. If you can't sit down and write through your model, uh, in, in paper, then um, you're stuck. Um, that's research lesson three. I do not sit down at my desk to put into verse something that is already clear in my mind. If it were clear in my mind, I should have no incentive or need to write about it. We do not write in order to be understood. We write in order to understand. Every draft of this paper, I've learned something. The breakthrough came when people pointed out, actually Craig pointed out, that you know j this just doesn't make sense. I can't get from here to here. And we tried to get from here to here, and we rewrote it, and we, we just couldn't do it. And you know why we couldn't do it? It, w it was wrong. The underlying economics was wrong. And when we realized we couldn't write it clearly to convince other people, we knew we had to have made a mistake. So what did happen? Um, probably nothing. Um, the model sets a low bar, but the state does clear it and be very vig vigilant about it. Um, Walker, could jump in any time and correct me if I've made a mistake. This is an oversimplification, but how does eminent domain work? Practically, boots on the ground. Well, the government will condemn the property, and it will take it by eminent domain. This will pop up periodically. Please ignore. Um, they, they, they'll take your property. They will pay the former owner a price that is supposed to be the market price as of before the announcement. And of course, it would have to be before the announcement because if your property is next to his property and we're going to build a condo there or a, a nice, pleasant park that's going to raise the value of the properties, the last guy can hold out and make a lot of money on that. So it has to be the price before the announcement. The government expects to be repaid for this by either explicit land rental contracts with the new user, or in some cases, they will initiate the redevelopment themselves to raise the tax base. 
Oh, uh, two things here. The government does not consider future profits. So if you have a highly valuable business that's uh, maybe simply software and intellectual property, then they're going to value it at the value of the software and the, in and the intellect, I'm sorry, they're going to value it at the, at the price of the real assets. So you're, you're not going to get the intellectual value of your property to future, capitalize future profits. The other thing is they will not consider any non-pecuniary benefits at all. I'm 86 years old. I've lived here all my life. I don't want to leave. My house is beyond price. The uh, legislative response to that is, well, that's too bad. Eminent domain has a very long history. Uh, this is the takings clause of the U.S. Constitution, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Uh, but it goes back way earlier than that. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him nor send upon him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. That's the Magna Carta, 1215. 800 years ago. So there's a very long history of government takings. Eminent domain is the textbook way to handle the holdout property. If we a problem. If we all agree we need a road and we need to take all of your property, there's a huge advantage to be the last person to sell. The rest of you will sell at you know, more or less one price. The last person holds up the entire project. They're in position to extract virtually all the rents of, from the road. And, and this isn't right because if I know that I can play that game, you're going to know that you can play that game. We never get started. We never get the road built. So this is a textbook way, and it makes uh, very good economic sense, and it has a long legal history. The difference here, again, was the private property angle. A Christian Science Monitor poll found that 98.5% of Americans disagreed with Kelo. Again, they weren't saying, I think the Supreme Court made a mistake in misreading the Constitution. I never heard anybody say that. It was all, it's not right for people to take the house. It's bad for, econo for economic development and property rights. That's not what the Supreme Court was supposed to decide. Uh, 40 states, it's 43 now I believe, have passed legislation at the state level restoring those rights. Yes, sir? My friends objected to the Supreme Court's reading of the Constitution. Your friends? Objected to the Supreme Court's reading of the Constitution. They thought it was a legal error? Yes. And, and, so that's not and maybe it isn't, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer. You know, I'm not taking that position. Uh, I, whether it's bad economics or not, I can take a position. Uh, but whether it's good or bad law, I don't know. The law, uh, my understanding, my readings on this surprised me. It was, um, I mean, here, despite being anticipated in legal circles. So while I'm sure there are people out there who with good legal training who thought it was a mistake, uh, apparently the consensus was, I believe I read that in an AIER publication, um, it, it wasn't a real surprise. Um, and yet, the Kelo backlash probably resulted in more new state legislation than any other Supreme Court decision in history. Salmon, in 2009, was writing a legal paper. And then we also want to point out Brown. Uh, this is one way to tell you've had an impact. Uh, this is Brown, 2009. The government wants to buy your house under the rules of eminent domain. And Hager says, why? And they say, we plan to build a road that will run right through your house. Even the comic strips got involved. When it gets down to the comic strip level, then the issue is foremost in the consciousness of the readership. Uh, I like the hooded enforcer with a club. I think that's a nice touch. But this is well entrenched in public consciousness if it makes it down to the comic strips in your local paper. Um, back then, there were still some papers. So, okay. um, We looked at this, that is my co-author, Tianning Lee and I, uh, looked at this and thought, well, well, we have an experiment we can do here. We've got over 40 states that have passed laws protecting property rights, and, and some did and some didn't. You may not be surprised to see that Massachusetts did nothing. 
There is no property rights law at the state level um, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, other states pass laws at different times. Georgia passed theirs in uh, November of 2006. Maryland passed theirs in May of 2007. So there's a little timing difference. We might be able to, to tease something out of the data there. And then there's also different levels of protection. It's one thing to write a law that says, uh, you can't do this period. And it's another to say, you can't do this unless it's blighted, with the term blight being undefined. Uh, the Castle, to Castle Coalition rates states on the strength of their laws. Georgia had a pretty strong law. They got a B plus. They insisted, that is the state law insists, that we have to condemn one property at a time. If I find your area is blighted, I have to condemn your property, then your property, then your property, then your property. I can't say all of these properties are bad. And I have to lay out my criteria ahead of time. If I want to say it's, uh, it, they're very run down in the sense of there are broken windows and there are parked cars out and things like that, I have to list all of those things. And that may be true for some of the houses in your area, but not yours. In Georgia, I have to condemn each parcel by itself. That's a kind of a high hurdle. Uh, on the other hand, um, Tennessee, oh, and it also uh, has to be unsafe. Tennessee got a D minus. They're, they said it can be blighted, but they left blight open to the definition of the taking authority. So we've had extreme examples. Uh, Lakewood, Ohio is my favorite. Let me get sure I get the details. This was 2004, and this was the minimum to avoid blight. Uh, three bedrooms, two baths, an attached two-car garage, and central air. The castle would fail. It would be a blighted property. Um, the mayor's house in Lakewood would be blighted. 90% of the properties in Lakewood, Ohio in 2004 would be blighted by that definition. I believe it was 60 Minutes sent out a crew to explore this takings case. Um, the, the reporting crew called in and said, we're lost. We can't find the blighted neighborhood. We think we're in the right spot, but there's no blight here. What should we do? And they checked, and they were in the blighted neighborhood. It was just they were all at least three bedrooms, attached two-car garage with central air. And it's just not what most of us would call blight even today, let alone 2004. This lets us give maybe there's some hope. We can tease some information out. Whatever we're looking for, we should find it in Massachusetts and Tennessee and not in Georgia. People have been here before us in related topics. Uh, Lopez and Tota um, looked at the determinants of the laws, and not so much the effect of the laws. And, and they said, you know, the title of their paper is the best or worst thing to happen to property rights, Kilo. It, it, the Kilo decision didn't say it's absolutely fine or a good thing for governments to take property. It said the Supreme Court doesn't talk about it. If you want to do something, just do it at the state level. It's perfectly fine for any state to pass a law along these lines as far as the Constitution is concerned, but it's not a federal issue. That's, that's what Kilo boiled down to. So, um, you know, given that, this could be the worst thing that happens to property rights because they're taken away and we lose them, or it could be actually the best thing because the states could put in laws that are much stricter than the federal laws if they so choose. That's pretty much their point. Uh, Lopez, Jewell, and Campbell were looking at how those laws actually came uh, to fore, whether the legislation was enacted had, um, <coughs> excuse me, whether the, the legislation was enacted had a lot to do with the voter backlash. The number of people complaining and screaming had a lot to do with whether a law was enacted. But it had nothing to do with the strength of the law. We were in the you have to do something phase. We don't care what it is, just do something. That seemed to satisfy people. It gets interesting, not so much for my paper, but you might want to read that looking for things um, that, that seem to lead to stronger laws. Um, states with more economic freedom seem to have stronger laws. Uh, more 
high, high priced, high valued housing. And you can spin stories about that, about how wealthy people control the political system and want to, and want to protect themselves. So they get that through, if you wish to tell that kind of story. Less racial homogeneity and more income equality enact stronger restrictions. This is, gets very subtle and very dicey. Uh, they, they, there's a literature that says communities that are less racially homogeneous tend to settle their problems along racial lines. If there's one large block, uh, uh, one large dominant racial group, then we tend to decide things based on, if you will, merits. But if you are in a, however you define merit, but if you have a society that is split with large blocks of many minorities, 20% of these, 10% of those, 20% of these, 30% of those, then problems tend to be decided along racial lines. Better or worse, I don't know. That's an interesting part of that paper. Thus begins the trap. Lou and Zelder in 2008 presented a paper and, and their basic equation was this. The price of housing should be a function of something controlling for kilo and other stuff. And that, that makes sense. Um, if, if you're going to lose your house or could lose your house, you'd figure the value of that house would be less. So they expected to find um, a, a kilo decision get, you know, hurting housing prices. And um, they got an insignificant coefficient. That, um, I'm sorry, the kilo control is actually kilo and state controls. Um, and, and they got the state laws insignificant. Um, if anything, it was a, it, the point estimate was negative. It was insignificant, but it was negative. And they were, they were quite bothered by that. Um, why is it they were expecting the state level laws to improve housing prices? And they didn't find it. They found nothing. Uh, and the negative was troublesome. Um, and so they're trying to explain why it's negative and why it's, the point estimate's negative and why it's zero. And, you know, you, you come up with the usual suspects. We don't have enough data. The data are not informative enough. We, you know, call, call me again in 10 years when I have more data. Uh, it could be that they had it modeled wrong. They had a specification error. The other stuff was ins in insufficient. They were missing some variables they needed, and so there was a specification error with all the attendant problems you get there. They also had a nice uh, economic story about endogeneity. Uh, suppose states with eminent domain laws um, tend to be enacted in states with low housing prices. And, and this is not out of the ordinary. I mean, I could think <sighs> Massachusetts has high housing prices. Connecticut has high housing prices. My guess is those would not be too excited, all else equal, given their political nature. Um, they'd probably not have strong laws. But it would make sense for Mississippi, Alabama, the cons more conservative states to say, you're not going to take my house. This is an offense. You're not going to do it. And housing prices are lower in that area. So that's a plausible story. This endogeneity thing, the laws are enacted in a selective way such that you would get high prices, weak law. You, you can see how that might happen. Uh, but it, they, they didn't have a good fix for that at the time. And they have since dropped the paper. Um, and and uh, maybe I need to get back to them and, and, and ask them a question because I think I have something to add now. The second uh, step in the trap was Carpenter and Ross. And this is a published paper. The previous one was a working paper. And it's pretty much the same as, as the previous one, in, except that they have construction jobs on the left. Or maybe they also had building permits or property tax revenues and things like that. And that's a function of the state level control and other stuff. And they got that the coefficient is also zero. And uh, they did a wonderful job of, of selling this. I mean, most people look at that and say, gee, it's insignificant. How can I sell this paper? This is terrible. And, and, and they, had, they did it wonderfully. They took the approach that, see, if you, want to, if you want to enact property rights laws, that cities will die stuff, that's garbage. You don't need to worry about that. If you want to enact a property rights law, go ahead and do it. You're not going to hurt anything. That's a nice way of selling a zero coefficient. I was very impressed. Bright guy, Carpenter. Didn't speak to Ross. Um, they go through the usual stories to make sure that you can't challenge them on, on their errors of any sort. Um, you know, weak data, specification error, they go through all of those and, you know, they don't seem to matter. 
Oops. So what could possibly go wrong with our study? Lou and Zelder have the price of housing as a kilo control and other stuff. Carpenter and Ross have a bunch of uh, construction jobs or something like that that should go uh, down if, or up with state level laws uh, and other stuff and, and they get nothing. So we have business formation, uh, kilo control and other stuff. I mean, what could go wrong here? I mean, they did it. Now we're going to do it. Our argument is that, um, that, in particular, we're interested in the state level laws because there's a lot more variation there. That should increase business formation. And what could go wrong? I mean, it, it fits perfectly with everybody else. So off we went. Uh, that's just a dummy for kilo. It's. Yes, it's a pooled time series regression. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Well, kilo is just a dummy, and we take that as given. And the state laws may be endogenous because you might enact a law you might say, wow, we don't need a law, it's in the Constitution, and then the Constitution doesn't say anything after all, and, and so you need a state law. So yeah, that they're not, they could be correlated. Um, okay, so here's our result. Um, both B and C are zero. So business formation is insignificantly related to kilo or state level laws. And, and we checked to explain why they might be zero, and we looked for the weak data story, and we went out and got another year's worth of data, and we found some other variables for robustness checks that I'll briefly put up, and um, we didn't find anything at all. Uh, we, we did what we thought we could do with specification error. We didn't find anything. We tried some nonlinear relations. We didn't find anything. We have the endogeneity story. Um, we just didn't find anything. So we kind of got really frustrated with the paper. Yes, that's what other people found, but I, we haven't really learned very much from this paper, and it was an awful lot of work, and we were getting pretty frustrated with it. Uh, but eventually the light went on. What's different is the underlying economics is different, and, and I'm going to go a step farther from that. The underlying economics is wrong. Difference suggests that the first couple papers were right. They're wrong, too. So, um, you know, we couldn't write this draft to make sense out of it, so finally, you know, what the heck's going on? We, we, we have to kick up our reasoning a bit. And we couldn't talk our way through it, so, so we eventually went back to the utility function and started with the utility function. We couldn't do a rigorous talk in, in, without doing the math. We had to do it. We tried, but we just couldn't do it. And, and all you need here is the stuff in green is you keep the property. P, they take it the probability of taking 1 minus p is the probability you get to keep it. And v of x is the value of your business as a function of how much money you threw into it. So the green is you keep the property. You get the utility of that if you keep it. In red, stop, you know, they take the property and they pay you gamma of x um, and then you get the public benefits of the property. So you get to go sit in the park or across the bridge or whatever. And then we're going to throw some other stuff in there too later. But that's basically it. You get some utility uh, when they keep it. When you keep it, you get some utility when they take it. And, and, and the math goes from there. But all you need now are those two things. The, the secret has already been given away if you caught it. Um, we don't have utility. We didn't notice it at the time. Uh, we don't have utility of course, so we need a proxy, and we use the Kaufman Index of Entrepreneurial Activity. We say that if the utility of your business is really high, you'll be more likely to start a business. If the utility of starting a business is not very high, you won't. And the Kaufman Index of Economic Activity has a, is a, a database of business formation. So we say that's a f the, the business formation is a function of utility and, and, and other stuff. For this talk, I'm not going to worry about that function G, but it's other things like tax, rate, tax rates and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of interesting economics, but it's not the point of the paper. Um, we also don't have the probability of the taking. So we have to model that too, and we say, you know, it's some 
constant C plus some effect of kilo plus some effect of the state law plus an error. With me so far? We're going to want to estimate C1 and C2. When we substitute these equations into equation one, we get a very common economic result, which I call the bad day. It was a very bad day. Um, I'm not going to go through the math, but look at that yellow stuff at the top. You're not estimating the effect of kilo, are you? You're estimating the effect of kilo as a function of how in the world did we miss this, the compensation you are paid. How in the world do you miss this? If, if I'm going to take your property but pay you full value, the effect of your utility or on your utility is very small. The immediate interpretation could be that the state is taking property whenever it feels like it, but it's paying fair value in some sense so that nobody cares. How did everybody miss this? It, once you say it, you say, oh God, of course. What's the big deal? But, but we didn't see it, and the other authors didn't see it, and the editors and reviewers of those other papers didn't see it. But it's so obvious. How did we miss this? So dang, this was a very, very bad day here. Uh, it turns out we can't answer the question, how did Kilo affect business formation? So we need a new title. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, there's a new insight here that we can look at. Um, we can look at that thing in yellow down at the bottom, you know, C1 and C2, <clears throat> and make predictions based on that. So one door is slammed in our face, and the other door, at least for our paper, and, and the other good news is that a door is opened. We can start looking at what we're getting by exploring delta. And, and what are we going to do here? So we turn to Robert Frost. Robert Frost says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and given the opportunity costs of time, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and more innovative. And that has made all the difference. So this is more innovative. We could repeat everybody else and say, yep, Nothing. And by the way, this is why. And, uh, and sent the paper out. And, and we thought about that. But we decided against it. We, we decided we would try to be a little innovative here and see what we could do by looking at this. So, so we have our lemonade model here. You know, after the various dangs for the bad day, we, we tried to make some lemonade. We're starting to look at this, OK? The implications of this coefficient, now that I have it, are pretty subtle. But once you hear them, you can put the model away and forget about it. Now that you know what you're talking about, you don't need the math anymore. Um, but look at the different ways that that coefficient can be zero. I mean, I'm going to keep it simple and say that, you know, um, the excess benefits of a bridge are pretty small. They're going to tax me to build a bridge, and then they're going to build a bridge. And I'll cross it sometimes, but, you know, hey, it isn't going to be like, it's not like they're, saving my life from an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth, right? They're building a bridge or something. So, you know, it's, it's nice or it's not nice, but it isn't really big compared to taking my business. So let's let that be zero. We can open that can of worms later if we want. Uh, what's another way that this could be zero? Well, they could pay full value, that is gamma, the compensation per dollar, could be one. As you have what dollars worth of business, we'll give you a dollar, you don't care. So you get a zero coefficient. Or it could be that the state level laws just don't mean anything. The state level laws are easily circumvented, so they don't matter. Or, you know, we're moving from a probability of 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 110,000. Who cares? But these are thoughts that just didn't occur to us until we wrote this down. So actually, I'm going to give you a pop quiz here. Remember the slide? 
Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in Zimbabwe, the government took this land without compensation, correct? You were paying attention yesterday or the day before, you knew that. So, all else equal, I haven't looked at the data and all that, but in this case, what can you tell me about this? This is a really hard question. Yeah, are you stretching or putting up a hand? Uh, I guess the coefficient is Which coefficient is negative? C1 is negative? The whole bunch of the Delt one, the whole thing. You're, you're ahead of me. I'm going to back it up. Uh, I'm going to say gamma is zero. That's the compensation. So now I can nail that one down. And I've got uh, negative one, correct? Yeah, negative one times whatever the value of the property was, plus whatever the public benefit is, times the real thing I want to measure. And now I can sign this because if, if the property was worth something, that's V, and if the benefits are small, now I've got negative one times the real thing, whatever I estimate is going to be the opposite sign. This is going to nail down the reality of the situation in a way that lets me say something intelligent. Now unfortunately I can't do that in mind because the, the states do pay something and I don't know how much. Um, so I can't do that, but um, there, there are applications of this elsewhere. Um, so I can't unfortunately do that in my paper, but, but this is applicable in other areas. So, so maybe there's hope that, that innovation will pay off. Um, let's see. What I can say, looking at this, and it was very difficult to do, uh, it's just too complex. Um, if you work through this and say, how does government look good? I, I can never find a case where government looks good and unequivocally say government did it right. What I can do is come up with cases where government is doing it wrong. For example, if they do this situation, they say, you know, I don't particularly like you because you donated to my political adversary. And so I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to take your property and pay you gamma very small. That will teach you to play with me along those lines. Political strong arm, horrible thing. In that case, depending on the true effect of these other parameters, I get one result. But it could very well be a positive or negative number because I'm underpaying you so much. Or it could be that you, you, know, you gave me a large political contribution and now you need repaid. I'll tell you what, I'll take these taxpayers' money and I will pay you gamma greater than one to take your business, yes, and we'll build a bridge or, or a park or a, a basketball arena or whatever on your property and you walk away more than whole and I got the campaign contribution expected the, at the expense of these people. So that's a bad thing too, that's corruption. Uh, that would be gamma greater than one and by making very reasonable assumptions on the others, I can come up with, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but it's not zero. The only way the government can be good here is if that coefficient is estimated to be zero. Now that's a, that's a pretty low bar because I can tell you stories where <laughs> it's, it's zero and government's not very good. They pay you fair value but they do something really, really horrible so that B is negative but it's not big enough to show up in the data. Government made a bad mistake. They took a, make, they're building a bad project. But I, I can't prove it. It's still zero. But if it's not zero, government has blown it. If it is zero, government may not have blown it. So it's a low bar, but, but at least it's something. Here is the only whoops, table I'm going to put up. Um, Basically, they're all zeros. Everything in yellow, that's the enactment of the state law. First leg, second leg, third leg, because you know, if, you've got, if you've got a business and you've been planning it for two years and you start it and then the, there's a state law, you're not changing your behavior. 
the sunk costs are already incurred. Going forward, hey, it isn't going to make any difference. You're already there. You're not going to get out of the business once you're that close. So they're all zero, every one of them. Now, it could be the data are uninformative. I don't know. It could be that I've got it specified wrong. I don't know. All the usual ones. But I can say this. It's also entirely possible that the state is paying fair value. It's also entirely possible that the laws make no difference. Um, I'm going to... Um, um, talk some robustness checks and then give you a little more information about interpreting that. Um, we we are, try to bill ourselves as careful researchers, so we, we put in all the things you could possibly come up with. Some of these were things that we did uh, while we were trying to figure out why it was zero, when we couldn't figure out why it was zero. One is interaction terms with tax burden and unemployment and income and, and, and things like that. We got no change. These variables were originally in that G that I spoke to earlier. Uh, we put in the property crime rate. Uh, that didn't make any difference. We used those A's and B's and C's and D's from the Castle Coalition, and that didn't make any difference. There were all kinds of robustness checks, and none of them made the slightest bit of difference. Once in a while, we'd get significance at the 10% level, but given the number of tests that we were constructing, it didn't seem to make sense for us to get too excited about those. They were very unstable. So it could have been a bad model, but we don't want to admit that. We, we like to think that we have the model right. It could be that the data are uninformative and could call me back in 10 years and I'll find something for you. Uh, it could be that it's too small to matter. I mean, moving from a 1 in 10,000 chance to a 1 in 11,000 chance isn't going to affect anybody's behavior. If it does, it's not going to show up in the data. Or it could be that the state gets it right and they pay fair compensation or close enough that nobody changes their behavior. Uh, I have a cynic friend, um, skeptic is probably better, um, or maybe you say, well, we live, unfortunately, in the rule of men, not the rule of law, in which case you could argue like this. Um, you know, if the state wants that property, I don't care what the law is, they'll change it and they'll take it. It's sort of like those mandated spending cuts that are supposed to occur. Yeah, they're, they're there by law. So are Social Security benefits. But they'll change it when they want to. Uh, it could be that you're a little more optimistic and you'll say, oh, there's no law that prevents takings. But you know, when things get too bad, there will be an outcry. After all, there was a 98.5% rate by the Christian Science Monitor, which tends to lean a little to the left, uh, and, and they found, you know, this, this is ridiculous, this Kelo decision, and, and they pushed the legislature to action. So, so it can't become too egregious either way. And, and so if you want to take those rather cynical definitions, then, you know, maybe that's why we're not finding anything. It's an implicit contract between uh, property owners and, and political realities. Um, since it could be either way, we'll just ignore it. So our summary is we started out to develop a theory that says states that enact legislation to restore property rights should have higher rates of business formation. Made perfect sense, it followed the literature. Uh, it turns out we didn't do that. Um, we developed a model showing the conditions under which we get a coefficient estimate of zero on kilo in the state laws. It's an entirely different paper. Uh, what are the conclusions? They're different from what other people have gotten. Uh, kilo, per se, is not necessarily bad. We don't know. Previous work has been mistaken. Um, what kilo does is open the door to corruption. If I can't take your property, then I can't punish my political enemies by taking their property. I can't reward my political friends by overpaying. So the story changes. Um, you know, overpaying and underpaying becomes the economic issue. Your job as a taxpayer is to be vigilant and make sure this does not happen. The Kelo decision in itself doesn't mean anything for economic development. How is it put into practice? State laws, same story. Um, 
I have a current example, and I'm going to try to be high tech here and, and load a website here and see if it, if it actually does it like it's supposed to. This is from the Daily Ticker, and the date is Tuesday, July 24th. Um, eminent domain, can it fix the housing market? And I, I won't bore you with the six uh, minute talk that he's going to do here. Instead, I'm going to skip down to a couple high points I want to point out. Um, down here we have Stephen Gluckstern, chairman of San Francisco based Mortgage Resolution Partners, believes he may have the answer to the country's housing problems. Okay, and, and, and what are those? And I lost my slide. There it is. Okay, what are those? Well, he plans to, let's see. Yeah, I'm too far down. Okay, using three California communities in San Bernardino Valley, uh, he's going to seize troubled mortgages in the name of eminent domain. All right. The communities would refinance these mortgages that they seize at rates that reflect the current property value of the home and then resell the mortgages back to the troubled homeowners at a lower rate. Well, in the context of what I know now, I want to say, how are you going to determine that current property value? What sort of controls do you have for that? And, and then when we go a step farther and we say, uh, Gluckstern says his proposal directly benefits the homeowner. If it's going to directly benefit the homeowner, uh, is there someone who's going to lose? It's very possible that it's going to directly benefit the homeowner because we're giving him a sweetheart deal. We're taking the mortgage from the mortgage holder and giving him what we claim is fair market value and then giving the new person a reduced principal value. Or it could be that we have a house that's not even underwater. Person, or it's underwater, but people are actually making their payments. So you, as the mortgage holder, are receiving payments. It's underwater. Given time, there's a good chance that you will be paid in full. But instead, we're going to take that mortgage, not give you the chance to work it out, pay you what we say is fair, and give the homeowner a break. The potential for corruption is high here. I don't know if it's legal. I can see ways it might work, but, but the potential for corruption is very large. For what it's worth, um, Gluckstern's plan does not involve government funds, but his firm does charge $4,500 for every mortgage that it would restructure under this plan. <laughs> so, um, and that was just from Tuesday. Um, I don't know. Oops, that's too soon. Um, the article says that, that he's, he's going after trusts. He's not going after banks. Banks don't hold the mortgages. That isn't quite... Um, they, they have to be involved in some way, because you're right, they hold the title. Not entirely sure whether there are many, many only packages. 
So um, second to last slide. Uh, recapping my goals, and, and you'll be able to tell me later whether I hit them or not. Um, you're not going to know your result until you're well along in your project. Don't let it bother you. Don't get, don't uh, attack a research project with a preconceived notion of the result. Yes, I know you'll have a prior, but if the data are telling you otherwise, either you need to revise that prior or you've made a mistake. I shared three research lessons that I hope will get you through times of difficulty, and I hope I've convinced you that the Kilo decision, which is now getting towards, was well, over seven years old, is very relevant for current events, but not for the reasons that people think it is. Uh, with our original question, what did happen to business formation, I, I don't see anything as happening. It's not because of the Kilo decision or the state laws. It's probably because the state is getting it reasonably right in terms of compensation, or at least they're not taking too many to have it show in the data. Um, the model sets a low bar, but the state clears it. And the moral to the story is um, stay vigilant, my friends. You have to pay attention to situations like the San Bernardino County one. It's entirely possible that that will go through with no problem whatsoever. It also opens the door for a whole lot of corruption. Those wouldn't be there if we didn't have Kilo decisions saying that it's okay to do this stuff as far as the Constitution is concerned. The Constitution is silent. Without that, we don't have to worry about things like this. Given that decision, it's not necessarily bad, but it could very well be. So stay vigilant, my friends. <laughs>